Great, thank you. So that's Mark 4, 26 to 34. Uh, we're going to listen to God's word now. Let me pray for us before we do. Father in heaven, we ask that as we come to your word now, you'll open our hearts and minds to receive your word. We will not only employ our intellectual faculties, but we'll use our imagination. We ask that your Holy Spirit would open up our, uh, our minds and our hearts to commune with you, the living God, and to know that in you, Lord Jesus, we have a friend. You became the friend of tax collectors and sinners, and that we will send your friendship as we as we study your word, as we listen to you speak to us now. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're reading Mark 4, verse 26 to 34, but just a bit of a reminder, the whole chapter, chapter 4, is all about the kingdom. It's all about Jesus speaking about what the kingdom is like, and the way that he teaches his people is he's using, he's using these, these parables. And the parables are confusing. Uh, in verse 10 and 11, you'll see of chapter 4 that, the disciples are confused by the teaching method that Jesus employs. Um, and Jesus clarifies things for them. <laughs> it doesn't really help because he says the, the words that he's using, the parables that he's using, uh, it is granted to those with ears to ear to understand them. But those that don't have the ears to ear, well, for them, the secret of the kingdom remains exactly that, a secret, a mystery. Um, and so we, we need the special unction of the Holy Spirit to open up God's word to us. And so that's what we've prayed for. But Jesus' teaching method fits with this. It's a bit confusing. Uh, and so the disciples, his friends, are perplexed by this. They say, hang on, you're all about the kingdom. You're telling us about your kingdom. You're telling us that you're a king. But what's your kingdom like? What's your kingdom like? And Jesus answers their question by giving them a series of parables, what the kingdom is like. Uh, and to give you a modern day equivalent of this, if you ask me, where am I from? I can give you a one word answer to that. I can name the town I grew, grew up in. But what you're really after is you're trying to figure out what was, what was your childhood like? What was it like growing up as Kruger in Clarksville? Uh, what, what was it like? What did you experience? Um, and so Jesus does that. He could give them a one line definition of the kingdom. Uh, and that should satisfy their intellects. But instead of just addressing their intellects, he's addressing their imaginations and he gives them these parables. So let's dive into these two parables and we'll play them off against each other to see what we can learn about what the kingdom is like. So verse 26, God's word of Mark 4. And he said, the kingdom of God is, it is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground. He sleeps and rises night and day and the seed sprouts and grows. He knows not how. The earth produces by itself, first the blade, then the ear, then the full grain in the ear. But when the grain is ripe, at once he puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. And he said, with what can we compare the kingdom of God or what parable should we use for it? It is like a grain of mustard seed, which when sown on the ground is the smallest of all the seeds on the earth. Yet when it's sown, it grows up and becomes larger than all the garden plants and puts out large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. With many such parables, he spoke the word to them, and they were able to hear it, as they were able to hear it. He did not speak to them without a parable, but privately to his own disciples, he explained, he explained everything. Uh, this is God's word. Thanks be to God. So let's um, dive in. I've got three points for you. I've neglected to bring my little sheet with me now, but the theme is, what is the kingdom of God like? What's the kingdom of God like? Uh, and uh, the first point would be that the kingdom is, is um, I really should have my notes with me. Uh, the, the computer will help me. Oh, there we go. The extraordinary ordinariness. Of the kingdom of God. There's the three points. Thanks, Abna. She came rushing in. It looks like one of those BBC. Have you seen that BBC clip where the boy crawls in, the baby uh, kind of crawls into the room, waddles in as the dad's speaking, and then the next moment the the, the, the mum rushes around the corner to drag him out <laughs> by the arm. Be ready for scenes like that today. Um, but the first point is the extraordinary ordinariness of the kingdom of God. What do we mean with this? The extraordinary ordinariness of the kingdom of God. If you imagine for a moment, Jesus uses this parable of the Jesus uses the parable of, of, of a man sowing to explain to them the, the ordinariness of 
the kingdom of God. And it's very hard for us to really imagine this, but um, if you grew up in the ancient Near East, you would often see a man sowing. If you perhaps walked towards Jerusalem on your way through the rural landscape, you'll see people sowing seeds, and it would be completely normal and ordinary. Um, and perhaps uh, an equivalent, at least in London, I remember when Thomas and Erna, me and Stefani moved to to, to London in 2004, uh, we were amazed the first couple of days in our little house in Wimbledon to see the, 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 the um, jumbo jets flying overhead every 30 or 40 seconds. And we would stand outside, we'll just, you know, you, it's, you struggle to fathom how these big things can be carried through the wind to land. Uh, after a while, it became completely ordinary. The noise of the jets as they fly overhead it's just part of the background noise. Uh, and perhaps you must view the sowing of seed in the same way. It's completely ordinary. You see a man sowing seed, but, but stop for a moment and think of the extraordinary thing that actually takes place. The, the parable alludes to it. The, the farmer sows the seed and he goes to bed and he gets up in the morning. Uh, and during the night and during the day, something happens under the, under the ground that is completely invisible to the naked eye. Uh, but the seed sprouts, the seed becomes a, becomes a, a, a grain, uh, and eventually it's fully grown. It's a plant. He knows not how. That's what verse 28 says. He knows not how this happens. It's something extraordinary that happens under the surface. Now, we can, can become quite used to whatever is this ordinary, but um, the Bible reminds us that the kingdom is a bit like this. It looks completely ordinary as you look at kingdom work taking place. But there's a magic. There is an extraordinary thing happening under the surface. And, um, and I wondered to what extent uh, we could perhaps compare this to kingdom work taking place right at this moment. If an alien came to visit all of us as we are uh, meeting together, he would peek through windows into houses or for those sitting outside, he would stand from a little distance and look at you and all he would see uh, would be a group of people perhaps you're on your own just looking at a screen uh, it looks completely ordinary there's nothing extraordinary taking place but as i hope you'll find out as the sermon carries on there is something extraordinary happening whilst the kingdom work is being done through the preaching of god's word as the seed of the gospel is being sown not just into our heads but also into our hearts there's something extraordinary that's taking place um, I don't, don't think Stefani enjoys this example, but, um, but I often peek in when she's ironing. This is when she enjoys, um, there's something happening now, thank you. Something um, extraordinary happening when Stefani is ironing. It's not the fact that she's ironing, it's the fact that she is, whilst ironing, uh, listening to a podcast, uh, listening to a sermon, perhaps listening to the Bible being read, uh, or listening to uh, worship music. Uh, and it looks from the outside as if it's something completely ordinary, but actually something extraordinary is happening on the inside. She is becoming more like Christ as the gospel enters through her ears into her heart uh, and, um, and shapes who she is. Um, so there's something ordinary about the kingdom, but extraordinary work takes place. Now, that's the first parable that Jesus tells. Um, and, and what he alludes to is that this work that's happening when the kingdom is being built is automatic. It happens all by itself, all by itself. You'll see that uh, Jesus uh, draws attention to this, that the farmer doesn't know how it happens. But he then says it happens all by itself. What a scene. What a scene to think that something as, as amazing as this, as a plant growing, happens all by itself automatically. Kingdom work is something that happens by itself. And we'll come back to the implications of this, but let me try to just point uh, three possible applications out for you at this point. The one is you'll need to be incredibly patient with kingdom work. It takes time. Secondly, you'll need to be very humble when it comes to the work of the kingdom. It's happening by itself. The farmer is doing some work, but he's not doing the magic, is he? He's not causing the seed to grow. 
the one who's causing the seed to grow is God. So it needs a humility. And then the third thing it requires, the right response to this work of the kingdom is, is worship. It's actually to marvel at what happens when God's doing his kingdom work. And that's to just stand in awe of the extraordinary thing taking place under the surface. Are you ready to do those three things? To be, to be patient, to be humble, uh, and to marvel at what happens as the kingdom is growing? Let's pursue this a little bit further. Let's, um, let's look at the second parable. The second parable speaks about the insignificant significance of the kingdom of God, the insignificant significance of the kingdom of God. Uh, and what you need to imagine, the picture on the screen is quite helpful to that. You see how tiny that mustard seed is. I'm not sure if that's an actual picture of a real mustard seed. It looks a little bit as if it's been photoshopped into it. But um, if you imagine what Jesus is doing, he's just told this parable of a sower that puts his hand into a bag that's perhaps hanging off by the side on his, uh, uh, on, his, on his hip. He pulls out a handful of seed and then he scatters it. And now he, he stops the parables. He slows everything right the way down and, and he invites his audience to come closer as he, he takes one of those seeds and he lifts it up and he has it in his hand like that. And he draws everyone in to come and have a look. Now, Stefania and I are commenting these days, we, we need to get the, the, the hand just at the right place in order to be able to see whatever is there. Uh, but everyone is squinting as they're trying to see this tiny little seed in his hand. Uh, and then what Jesus points out about this seed is he points out that this seed, tiny as it is, when it is sown, it grows up and it becomes this large tree. It becomes this large tree. Uh, and when it becomes this large tree, he carries on to say it's not just the fact that it's become a large tree, but it becomes a place where the birds of the air can make its nest in its shade. So Jesus points out a tiny seed that becomes a big tree, and the big tree becomes a place of refuge for all the birds of the air. This is Jesus' picture, and he's trying to teach us something about the kingdom. He's trying to teach us something about the kingdom. In the first parable, he was teaching us that, that this kingdom work is ordinary. It looks completely pedestrian, but it's utterly extraordinary. Magic happens under the ground, and something grows all by itself. And now he takes us to that thing that grows all by itself. And he says, now look at its insignificant beginnings. Look at how tiny the seed is. Uh, and how big it then becomes. And, and look at the incredible refuge that it gives to a great multitude, not just of birds, but to the nations. Uh, look at the huge impact of this tiny seed. And Jesus is teaching us something about the kingdom. Insignificant beginning with great significance in the end. You know, of course, what the seed is whenever the gospel is being preached we're not just preaching a principle. We're not just preaching doctrine. We're not just teaching you uh, how to think properly. We're actually introducing you to a person if you're not a Christian. We are leading you and helping to get to know Jesus Christ, a friend of sinners, better. We are, as we are sowing the seeds of the gospel through preaching and the sacraments and pastoral work, we are constantly inviting you into the shade. We're inviting you into the shade that is Jesus Christ. Jesus is the insignificant seed. Now, Isaiah 53 uh, will remind us that Jesus was not someone that was, that was attractive to look at. He wasn't someone that was imposing in his personality, that was drawing crowds through his charisma. In fact, he was someone that people despised. He wasn't attractive to look at. Jesus was a man from Nazareth. What good can come from Nazareth? Jesus was insignificant. And if the world history were to hold out, hold out its hand and it would draw people to have a look at Jesus Christ before his death, resurrection and ascension, it would be the tiniest, most insignificant of seeds on the hands of world history. 
And this is what the kingdom of God is like. It has this insignificant beginning. But then it becomes, it becomes this, this tree, this tree in which the birds can make their nests, in which the nations can come and find refuge and, and shade. And so let's go back to those three applications I pointed out earlier. The right response to the gospel is, firstly, uh, to, to be, um, I can't remember it. I know the second one is to be humble, but the first one is to be patient. And I had a chat comment here. Who was it? Nikki that said, that's very true. Much patient is required when God is busy. So let's just delve into that for a minute. Can I just have a reaction from people to know that I'm not, not just preaching to a blank screen? If you can, you can do a little hand clap or a thumbs up or a little heart or something that will remind me that I'm not just speaking to a blank screen at the moment and you're still half awake. Um, the kingdom of God is, is this... Is, is this seed that's sown, this tiny insignificant seed that becomes this significant place of refuge, and it requires patience. And patience is required firstly with yourself. Are you impatient with yourself when kingdom work is being done in your life? Thank you, Richard. There's a, a clap that's just come through. Are you patient, Jean-Pierre? Is there a, are you patient when, when God's God is busy with you and he is doing kingdom work in your heart? Or are you impatient with yourself? Perhaps you can find your own impatience when you walk into a Christian bookshop and your eye all, uh, immediately goes to the books that has titles like Three Easy Steps to Christian Growth or 40 Days to Christian Growth or Personal Renewal or um, 10 Ways to Improve Your Walk with Jesus. <sighs> I would like to counsel you to be more patient as kingdom work is taking place in your life. If you don't learn patience first with yourself, you won't have patience with your loved ones, with unbelievers. You won't have patience with the church as it goes about its work. Patience is required because the work that is happening is happening all by itself when you have no control over it and I'm not sure we've got many farmers on this phone call. I can say these things because my youngest brother is a farmer. I think he, he's quite, quite, uh, he's quite um, proud about what he does as a farmer. But when we sit down late at night after a glass of wine, he would say to me, Kruger, you know, it's, it's really amazing. I, I, I just prepare the soil. I just, I just plant at the right time. And it's incredible to see that as I... Uh, provide food for my cattle and I plant the, the seeds for it I've just scattered the seed and and then it happens all by itself I need to wait for it I need to be patient as it's taking place I can't rush the process it's not something that I'm in charge of but God is doing something amazing so patience patience with unbelievers as you share the gospel we often look for fruit immediately as we share the gospel we want people to react quite quickly. Perhaps today you share the gospel and they've got a thoughtful question. You think, my goodness, hey, tonight I'll share with my Bible study group, my missional community. We've got to pray. This person is really interested. And tomorrow I see him at work or I have a Zoom call or at school. The conversation continues and I'm even more excited. And tonight I share with my little prayer group again. Look, we've got to keep praying. God is doing something here. Uh, we get impatient because, hang on, he, he's coming through or she's coming through. And then... The next day, there's nothing. In fact, he or she avoids you. And if they do speak to you, it doesn't lead to spiritual conversations at all. Be patient. Kingdom work takes time. Be humble. Be humble because, as my younger brother learned, he is not the one that's in charge of the process. God is the one that causes the growth. And one of the telltale signs that you have become proud or self-sufficient or self-reliant in your kingdom work is your lack of prayerfulness. Perhaps you have a colleague or a friend or a loved one that you're sharing the faith with. Perhaps even as you look at your own heart and your own doubts and fears, you are impatient with your lack of growth. And the way you like to address it is through reading a book like Three Easy Steps to Christian Growth. And actually what you forget is that you need to take a humble position and you need to depend on the Lord and rely on his way of bringing his kingdom into your life. 
And that is through the word being preached to you. It is through the use of the sacraments. It is through Christian fellowship and community, accountability. It is slow, careful work that takes time. But it's not yours to do. It is the Lord himself that's doing it through his church, through his ordained servants as they preach and teach the gospel. Be patient. Be humble. And lastly, marvel. Marvel at the incredible growth that comes when God's at work. And this growth is not extraordinary, not by the world's measures at least. The growth that takes place is, well, it's just a green blade that's breaking through dark red soil. And it's a fragile little thing. As someone starts to produce, produce the fruit that comes from the kingdom's work in his or her heart and imagination, it, it looks like nothing to the world. But for those with eyes to see, they can see that the Lord is at work here. And why don't we marvel more at what the Lord has done in our lives? Why don't we marvel and worship more at what the Lord has done in the life of his church? Why don't we marvel more at the incredible grace that the Lord has shown to a community and to a city and to a world that does not deserve it? I think we often find out that the real disposition of our hearts are that of criticism, of unthankfulness, of disparaging uh, contempt for the work of God. We don't see the beauty of all that he's done and he's doing in our lives and the lives of our children, our loved ones, our communities, our city. We find often that our conversations turn to those things we find fault with rather than the things that are beautiful and God honoring. Shall we come back to be a humble to be patient and to marvel at what the Lord is doing and to praise him for even the smallest work that's taking place in people's lives. Now, at this point, I could end the sermon and it would be helpful. I'm sure you'd be glad because it won't be that long. But the trouble is, the trouble is we have not yet spoken of the power of the gospel and what the seed actually is. So let's just do that now in the third point. The seed, the tree, and the shade of the kingdom of God, the, sh the seed, the tree, and the shade of the kingdom of God. You know, when Jesus first tells the parable, you see the sower with his hand full of seed, and he scatters it, and he draws attention to the fact that there's something happening that's happening all by itself. It's amazing what God's doing. And, and then he draws him in to look at one singular seed, and he says, look at the single, tiny, small seed producing this huge tree with all the shade. Uh, and for those with ears to hear and for those with eyes to see, they should and could make the connection that the seed that Jesus is referring to is himself. He is this insignificant seed. And within him is all the power, all the potential bound up in this man from Nazareth it, it is all the potential to bring about the tree that will bring the shade. And Jesus is the seed. And if we carefully think about this, we realize that when Mary, the Virgin Mary, became pregnant, it was the seed from heaven, we are told. It's the Holy Spirit that's conceived Christ in the womb of Mary. That is the seed. The seed is, is God that is born into women that brings himself into the world. And, and so when Jesus comes into the world, the lips, the words most often on his lips were the words of Matthew 11, come to me all who labor, I heavy laden, and I will give you rest. What else is a tree? If you think of Noah's Ark and you think of the tree that uh, the dove eventually finds a branch to sit in and brings a little olive branch back to Noah so that he knows that there, he, there is a place of refuge on earth. The tree is a place of refuge. Jesus was saying, I am the place of refuge. I am the rest. Come to me, all who are heavy laden and burdened, and I will be the tree of shade. I will give you that refuge. But of course, how did Jesus become this tree of refuge? He's quite clear about the fact that he is the seed. And he's quite clear about the fact that he is the one that gives refuge and shade. But when did Jesus become the tree? When did Jesus become the tree? It's not that Jesus became a tree. No, it was that he was hung on a tree. It's that he was hung on a tree. And it's in Deuteronomy 5 that we read that cursed is everyone who's hung on a tree. 
It's in Galatians 3 that the Apostle Paul draws attention to this fact as well. And he says, Jesus became a curse for us by being hung on the tree. It is how Jesus becomes the place of refuge for us, is by being hung on a tree. So if you ask the question, what is the kingdom of God like? Well, it's a place of refuge. It's a place of rest. But it's become that place for us through the seed that became a man that then was nailed to the cross for our sin. And perhaps it's here that we have to stop for a moment and think, where is our hope? What is it that we have placed our hope in? Even such a delightful theme as the kingdom of God. It's very attractive to think for a moment that what's really wrong with the world is God's kingdom needs to come. It's God's kingdom that's needed. Perhaps you've not thought that far ahead. You thought, well, what's really wrong with the world is, is social inequality. Perhaps vaccine nationalism. Perhaps what's really wrong with the world is the lack of, of, a, of a vaccine or corruption or crime. Uh, and what needs to happen in order to fix the world is, well, we need to get these one or two or three solutions that will fix the world. And I have to caution you at this point. I mean, the reading, uh, there are certain readings of the book of Revelation that does not focus on the tree which is the real focus of the whole book of Revelation. Uh, we can easily get, get wrapped up uh, in the whole reading of the book of Revelation in its different, uh, uh, in its different symbolism. It's a wonderful work of symbolic poetry. Uh, and my own view of it is that large parts of it has already taken place. It's already happened. At least up until chapter 11, I would say that uh, John was being shown what would soon take place. That's how the letter is introduced. And it did, in, in fact, soon took place. 70 AD, the church is sacked in Jerusalem. Uh, and, and all of these things that are described then happened. But it mentions a tree and it mentions this tree right at the end into the far, far future. And that is still something that we look forward to is, is to the new heavens and new earth in its full consummation. We're looking forward to this to take place. This tree that is mentioned in Revelation 21. But this tree, if we just stop for a moment and think about the symbolism behind the tree throughout the Bible, you'll find that we have a tree right at the beginning. The tree that once Nathan from introduces sin into the world. And then right at the end of the Bible, we have a tree uh, of which the leaves are for the healing of the nations. And right at the, uh, right at the middle, so the, the, the introduction of sin into the world through the one and the, the joy of healing through the, through the eradication of sin in the world by the other. But right in the middle of these two trees, well, there is the Lamb of God, the, the one who was hung on the tree in order to introduce the tree of life. The, the Lamb of God becomes... Uh, from his throne comes the water that feeds the tree that is for the healing of the nations. And so as we think theologically about the end times, we need to fix our eyes not on the signs of the times, but we need to fix our eyes on, I very nearly said, on the kingdom of God. Not even that. We need to fix our eyes on the king of the kingdom of God. And I want to implore you at this time to see Jesus as a friend of sinners and tax collectors, first teaching them through a parable that seems quite general and vague, and then inviting them in to look at the singular seed in order to see the singular seed, and then almost dropping his hand so that they can see this seed, Jesus Christ. And as they look into his eyes, they can see here they have a tender and gentle uh, savior. One who is the answer to all the longings of their hearts. Please let us not rely on intellectual salvation, perhaps a doctrine or a theory about the end of the world or about the solution of our times. Let us not place our hope uh, merely on human means, a vaccine or, or the end of corruption, anything like that. But let us fix our eyes on Christ, the author and perfecter of our faith. Let's fix our eyes on Christ. He is, we are told in Matthew 11, he is gentle and lowly 
in heart. Gentle and lowly in heart. Can you think of something more gentle and more lowly than the God of the universe being born into a woman as a tiny seed? Can you think how gentle and lowly the God of the universe had become in order to do that and then to be born as a baby, dependent and small? Can you imagine how gentle and lowly our Savior is that he then grew up to become a man who then willingly went to the cross to, not to die for our sins. This is the Savior that we have. Gentle and lowly, and tender and affectionate in, in his heart, in his very nature, in the core of his being. And it is this that I, it is him that I would love for you to fix your eyes on. Uh, during our current challenges. Let us not look for another solution. Let us fix our eyes on Christ. Let me pray for us and give thanks to our Father. Our Father in heaven, we give thanks for your Son. Give thanks for your Son that took on human flesh. That so, so tenderly and so gently came into this world. We still have Christmas carols ringing in our ears and we remember the the warmth and the joy of Christmas. But Father, that is just a tiny foretaste of the real tenderness that you feel towards us, your people. Yeah, we are, we are torn this way and that way by our own sin, by all kinds of theories and predictions in the world, by um, spiritual attack through various forms. And yet we have a saviour that is so gentle, so tender, that he became a tiny seed, that he became a mighty saviour, and that he became a place of refuge and rest for us all. Father, our prayer this, this afternoon is that you would help us to come into the shade and avoid the sickle. That's really these two parables as they are placed next to each other. If we do not put our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, if some of us decide to be impatient with your work in our lives and we decide to be haughty and proud about our own salvation and say we will do it ourselves, uh, if, we, if we do uh, stop to give you praise and honour for what you've done in our lives, Father, we easily can introduce the sickle into our lives, a sign of judgment throughout the Bible. But we want to come into the shade, the refuge that you've provided for us in your son. So we ask that we'd fix our eyes on your son, who is gentle and lovely, and we would come home to you. And we love you, Lord Jesus. We love you. We love your work in us and through us. We long to see your work in our brothers and sisters in this church and in the church worldwide. Please show more of yourself to us and, and calm our our anxious hearts and, um, and soothe our weary souls with your very presence in your church. We ask this not for our own glory. We'd love to marvel in your presence. We'd love to, to, to glorify you as the one who's building your church and your kingdom. And, and we'd love, Father, to be completely patient with the work that you do in us. Please come and do that through the power of your gospel. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.